Uh, let's establish a few things here. We have a problem. Um, I don't speak American. You can tell that already. And I'm guessing you don't hear English. So that means we, you're going to have to at least pretend to be with me. Just smile, nod. It keeps a speaker encouraged, right? Or listen really intently if you want. Um, the other thing I'd love you to do today is I'd love you to uh, tweet me directly what you hear jump out from this talk. I've done this in a few... Oh, by the way, I was speaking at Bailey University recently. They don't sing half as well as you lot. That was brilliant. And uh, make sure you tell them that when you get the chance. The, um, I know they've got a football team, but they can't sing like you lot can sing. Um, and uh, what I'd love you to do is I'd love you to just, if a sentence or a line or a thought or a couple of words just jump out in this next 25 minutes, I'd love you to tweet it. It does a couple of things. One, it helps you reflect on the stuff that the Lord might be saying to you today. And, and in that physical act of actually writing it down, it's something that you'll remember well. So I'd love you to physically engage with this talk by tweeting me. I'm uh, Jem John Burns, G-E-M John Burns. And at any point today, just tweet that out. Or as you reflect on the talk, perhaps later today, just tweet me it. And uh, that'll help me understand what the Lord's doing in your life as well. And the other problem we have today is this word, football. I do get sick of apologizing for this issue. So, so, you know, the rest of the world calls a round white ball football, right? We know that, right? And, and, we, would, and, and we would tend to call something where you throw it and you use your hands. We probably wouldn't use the word foot in that title. Um, but but I, I do try and be, you know, sensitive to where I am. So occasionally I'll say the word soccer. Occasionally I'll say the word football. They mean the same thing. When I say it, it just means proper football. Okay? That's where we're heading. I want to tell you about three stadiums that changed my life. Football stadiums. The first one was when I was eight years old, and my grandfather was a big Middlesbrough fan. They're back in the Premier League after seven years of pain. And uh, my grandfather took me when I was eight years old. And back in the day, late 70s, it was a really violent place. You know, it's not where you really should be taking your grandson. And it was pretty violent back in the day in England. And we went to this match, and we sat there, I was sat next to my grandfather, and the opposing forward scores a goal against our team. And my grandfather stands up and starts clapping. I'm like, what? See, this guy who scored the goal, it was his 40th goal of the season. It hadn't been done. In fact, it wasn't done until Ronaldo again recently. And my grandfather just decided to honor the guy. So he stands up and starts clapping the wrong team, right? I learned a lot of new words as an eight-year-old <laughs> in the next few seconds, right? Everyone's screaming. I'm like, granddad, sit down. We're going to get our head kicked in. Everyone's screaming. I'm swearing. I'm... And it seemed to be like this moment that lasted forever till one by one, other people started standing up and applauding the wrong player, the wrong team. It put something in me deep that day that if someone is prepared to have the courage to stand up and do the right thing, other people will follow. I, uh, I was a bit of a bad lad for a few years. When I was 15, 16, 17. I got into football. I got into fighting. I got into girls. Um, and actually only one of those is a good thing. And, uh, and, and uh, when I was 17, Billy Graham was coming to Roker Park, Sunderland's football stadium near us. 1984, big crusade, Dr. Graham was coming. And I had this cunning plan that me and my friends could get on this bus that the local Baptist church was putting on. We could go to this thing, and I knew you got a chance to become a Christian at the end. So we were going to go on the field and steal some turf because they were the team we hated up the road. Great plan. That's how smart I was. So literally, we get on this bus, Baptist put it on, we go, and no turf was stolen. And one by one, me and my five friends all became Christians. It wasn't like Nicodemus. You know, we didn't come secretly at night. This was public. And, and Dr. Graham preached this passage we've just read. And that famous John 3, 16. And I chose to be born again that day. Incredible, incredible moment. Changed my life. Jesus interrupted me from all the stupid stuff I was doing to a life of purpose. And uh, I, be, I was a builder after that, and then I was a policeman, and then I got called to work for a church, and then I went to seminary, and then I ran some national ministries. In fact, I ended up working for, for Dr. Graham running a Young Evangelist Institute in England. 
changed my whole life when I chose to be born again. And life was going good. I was a proper Christian minister, doing all the Christian stuff, until the third stadium that changed my life. In 2004 in Lisbon, Stadio de Luz, which actually we, we'd say is Stadium of Light. It actually means in the presence of the light, if you look at the exact translation. So I'm there. It's England versus France. It's the Euros 2004. And the middle of the second half, I have an epiphany moment. And I asked myself this question, what if I'm the only evangelist in this stadium? And there was 45,000 England fans in the stadium that day. 65,000 fans, 45,000 England fans. And suddenly I asked this question, or the Lord asked it, I don't know. What if I'm the only evangelist here? And I remember sitting down in my seat like, God, leave me alone, right? You've got every, it's my one dirty little habit, right? You've got everything else. Can I not just go and watch football with my friends? And that day an idea was born called Lion's Raw. And Lion's Raw is a, a movement that I've been leading for about 10 or so years. And it basically takes uh, football fans, Christian and non-Christian football fans, to do service projects around the world. We've built orphanages and schools and everything else. And rather than me talk about it, I thought I'd show you it. So when I moved here to America in 2014, CNN got hold of it and I got this CNN Hero Award. So why don't you watch this film and it'll show you what we've been doing. The potential for change surrounds us. You just have to be open and willing to play when that great idea hits. John Burns found it in a crowded football stadium in Lisbon, Portugal. He looked out at the rowdy fans with their faces painted, shouting all kinds of obscenities, and he thought, yes, these are the people with a passion big enough to do some good in this world. In 2006, John started Lions Raw. His organization harnesses that loyalty of football fans attending major tournaments to rebuild orphanages in South Africa, renovate a prison in Poland, and construct an academic center in Brazil. More than 500 fans have traveled to these underserved places. They've formed lasting bonds with each other and the kids. This change happened because John was not only open to this crazy idea, but he was willing to play heart and soul to give these kids a chance to thrive. All over the world, football is the game. It's so simple, anybody can play anywhere. A kid in the middle of nowhere, right up to a competitive sport all over the world. The atmosphere at a World Cup is like nothing else, it's electric. The drama, the excitement. It captures people. It was 2004, I was in the full stadium. I suddenly saw all the fans around me. It was like it was an untapped army. And I started asking myself, what could I do if we could mobilize some of these people to do some good? This building project going to a day is literally changing lives. In Brazil, we're building a new education center with local partners. Over there is going to be three classrooms to do this for us, for the children. This is a World Cup spirit. You've never had muck this good. We had about 300 volunteers here from about 12 countries. Within a couple of days, they're just part of a team full of fun and working really hard. Doing something together for someone else is always a great bond. And the World Cup is just a launch pad for us. Our first key volunteer project was in 2010 in South Africa. It's the epicenter of the AIDS epidemic. We met a great couple called Russell and Precious, who were with the kids that had been orphaned. They had a whole stack of kids living in this tiny two-bed house. So about 50 guys built them a new four-bed home. I wish I could move today. <laughs> I didn't expect that the football fans can do this, but they did. Our life is much better now. The children, they have their own rooms. <laughs> There's now 18 kids there. We help feed them, clothe them. We're long-term committed to them. Lowndes Road, they're like our family. For us, it's not just about the child that we help. If people go on a trip, it transforms them. 
Before Lions Raw, never done anything quite like this. Went to Durban four years ago and we built an orphanage. This time my son has come with me. He sort of saw the difference that had made to me and he wanted to try and make a difference to people as well. I know you're knackered every morning, you're tired out, but look how far we've come in a week. It's fantastic. <laughs> I love football for what it is. Camaraderie. Teamwork. For this today. Friend. My life. But I particularly love football for the power it has, the power to create change. It's my honour to present CNN hero, John Burns. It's uh, genuinely incredibly humbling to be recognised as a CNN hero, particularly in such company tonight. Thank you. But the real heroes of Lion's Raw are the children in need all over the world that we get to serve, and the people who give their time and their money and their talents to help us create even more chances for change. We need a global army of heroes that serve heroes. So please come and join us. Thank you. He just asked me, was it your wife you kissed? Of course it was my wife I kissed. <laughs> Not just some random woman at the table. You know? <laughs> I think he was shocked because she was beautiful. He couldn't work out I had a beautiful wife. <laughs> um, so I've had this lines roll thing for 10 years. You know, if you're crazy keen on soccer and you want to get involved, you can. It, it's gone from strength to strength. I got an award of the Queen last year and then, and I had all these plans. It was going great. In fact, I'm in Cuba in two weeks' time, signing a partnership with the American Outlaws Group. Some of you will know that. Biggest fan group in the world, the American National. And they've got uh, 186 chapters around the country. And they're going to set up a Lions Row program in 186 cities across America in the next three years with us. It's amazing. So it's all going well. I've got a plan. I've got my life getting very exciting. We're getting exposure with CNN and BBC and the Queen. And then, blooming heck, Jesus interrupted again. I don't know whether you know Jesus like this. He just keeps interrupting your life. He interrupted Nicodemus' life, and we don't know what happened next. He interrupted my life when I was 17, and he kept interrupting it. And uh, a year ago in September, uh, like probably you, I was sat watching TV and seeing all the refugees crashing on the beaches of Europe, you know, in Lesbos, where right now, literally right now, we just heard half an hour ago, there's a riot going on. Six of our staff are in the middle of a riot in a camp in Moria. In fact, let's just uh, stop and pray now, shall we, for that. Lord, we pray for all those that are in that camp in Lesbos right now that are in the middle of a pretty ugly riot. Pray for the GEM staff and other people that are trying to serve you faithfully there. We pray for their protection. And Lord, you are the Prince of Peace. So we pray in the powerful name of Jesus that peace would reign in that camp even now as we're praying. Amen. Amen. So I'm watching the screen, all this refugee things happening, and I'm like, why am I sat in America? When the center, it seems like to me, the center of what Jesus is doing right now is in Europe. Thousands and thousands of Muslims landing daily, 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 desperate for hope. And the only answer I could come to was that Jesus was interrupting me again. And that my plans for all that were good and great were not what he had for me next. And so I applied to become the leader of GEM, and I got the job, and, and this has been the most ridiculous year. I don't know whether you know, but 1.2 million Muslims have arrived in Germany this year. We've got a guy in Frankfurt, um, and he, he put on a little church conference for pastors that were looking how to integrate new people from other faiths who wanted to start exploring Jesus. He was expecting 10 churches, 180 churches turned up. Because they were seeing Muslims come into faith daily. What do we do with these Muslims that are coming to faith? We, we heard this weekend of, of a handful of people that got saved on Moria again this weekend in the camp outside on Lesbos. 
Literally, there's crazy things happening. Jem's 65 years old, 67 years old. We have about 300 missionaries all over Europe and loads of interns and short-term teams. In fact, we've got this weird thing where loads of them are ex-Wheaton grads. What's that about? So we've got loads of Wheaton grads with us as interns and missionaries. And in fact, half my leadership team are Wheaton grads. So you must be doing something right here. And, uh, and, and, and just in the last five years, we've seen 30 new cities uh, new city ministries planted, and just short of a hundred new churches planted through the work of Gem. And really, the, the reason I wanted to come and speak today is I want you to be interrupted like I've been interrupted. You know, we are looking for people that would dare go and do something crazy with us. We're looking for people that we can give church plants to. We're looking for people we can give cities to and nations to. And I'm guessing, because of the track record I'm seeing, that lots of them are sat in this room today. I'm guessing some of you could dip your toe in the water with us. You could come and have a look at Mission in Europe. You could do a short-term team or an internship, or, or maybe you just know you're meant to be there, and you could join us. And who knows what adventure might happen for you. These are crazy days. You know, a year ago in November, Paris was bombed, right? We've got a girl called Jazz. She's from Hawaii. She's been a missionary with us for two and a half years. She was in their soccer stadium when the bomb went off last November 13th. And, uh, you know, she's got a real heart for reaching out to local Muslim women. And she's been doing that faithfully. She kind of returned to work. And then Christmas Day, she kind of got this feeling, why am I in Paris? with all these dangers when I could be on a beach in Hawaii with my friends? Pretty fair question, right? And she's had to wrestle with the calling and the cost. She's had to wrestle with the fact that Jesus called her to this glorious adventure. Jesus interrupted her and she said yes. And as she's come through that, in fact, we've just written a book uh, with Tyndale that we publish in November. We're launching it in Paris this year of her story and our founder's story, Bob Evans, how both of them ended up in France because God showed them the time was now. And I believe that. I, you know, we were founded right on the back of the Second World War when the need in Europe was great. I think the need in Europe right now, it's never been greater since then. You know, if you're, if you're a, a Muslim fleeing Syria and you're prepared to throw your child over a fence because you're that desperate, you are running for hope. You're running for change. You're running for new life. What better way to reach people? You know, for years we've had missions into the 1040 window and you have to be very, very careful in the 1040 window who you say what to. Suddenly, those that are desperate for change and hope are coming to Europe. What a moment. What an opportunity. This year, we're hearing of people coming to Christ all over Europe. And not just Muslims, you know, native Europeans. You know, it's still the most unreached continent in the world. You know, people sometimes say, why Europe? You know, why don't we go to Africa? Why don't we go to South America? Well, Europe is the most unreached continent continent in the world. You know, you go to places in France or Italy and Spain, you won't find anywhere near 2% evangelical committed Christians. Nowhere near. Some of those countries, it's less than 1%. You know, we've been sending missionaries to Chile. I don't know whether you know, but in the last 20 years, 20% of Chile has come to faith. 20%. If only we could see that in Italy or France or Spain. Germany, Russia, Turkey, places we still have to pioneer. I wanted you to imagine your Nicodemus for a moment. Or just imagine you sat at the feet of Jesus this morning. Imagine the conversation like we read earlier. Imagine Jesus interrupting your religious knowledge with the fact of being born again. You know, I'm making an assumption this morning that lots of you know Jesus personally, but some of you might not. Some of you might have, like Nicodemus, a, a religious knowledge, a religious history, a religious experience. But if you're honest, you've never come into a new life with Jesus. You've never actually said yes to being born again. 
this old word we don't use very much, but it's still as relevant today. We have to be born again by water and the Spirit. Knowledge is not the key here. It's a heart conversion that Jesus is talking about. And if you've never done that, you could do that today. You know, you've probably heard this talk a number of times. But today, would you let Jesus interrupt you? Would you let Jesus interrupt you and say, you need to be born again. You need to start again a full and fruitful life with me, Jesus, at the center of it. Who's that? Was that Jesus interrupting us? Was it? <laughs> I'm open to stuff like that, you know. <laughs> My guess is for many of the rest of us, it might be a little bit different. My guess is that if we imagine ourselves sat at the feet of Jesus today, he might have other things to say to us. He might want to say, keep going. You're doing well, keep going. He might want to say, ah, oh, I want to interrupt your plans. You've got all these plans for this, that, and the other. I've got a different plan. That's what he's done to me three or four times in my life. You know, if you'd like to know more about this stuff, uh, I think the details will be up on the screen. There's some websites there. I'd love you to tweet me. But more than anything else, you know, I, it doesn't really matter to me whether you come to Europe or you do anything else. What matters to me is that you dare to allow the voice of Jesus to interrupt you at key moments in your life. Because your plans, to be honest, are rubbish. You know, the, the things that Jesus has done with me, I could never have dreamed or imagined. The truth is, I'm just a normal guy in the hands of the incredible God, which means that anything is possible, right? Or else we don't really believe this stuff. I'm just an average guy in the hands of an incredible God, and so anything is possible. And that's true for you if you'll put yourself in his hands, if you'll dare to be interrupted, and if you'll dare to be obedient, whatever the risk or the cost. Would you stand with me? We just pray that. Let's pray as we finish. <clears throat> um, I'm going to pray that God interrupts you today while you're here at this college. Whatever he needs to do, but you probably shouldn't say amen unless you mean it. Because God hears little promises like that. Just when you expect it least. Ta-da! He jumps out <laughs> with a little shock, a little word, a little change of plan. If you ask him to, he does. Let's pray. We love Lord Jesus that even 2,000 years ago when a guy secretly meets you, you have ridiculous things to say to him. And for lots of us, that's been our experience of you already, that you called us to be born again. And Lord, for anyone here who, who doesn't know you like that yet, Lord, please interrupt them. And for the rest of us, Lord, we submit our plans to you because we assume that your plans are better than ours. We assume that what you think of us is greater than what we think of us. We assume that you see potential in us that we don't even dream of. And so as ordinary people, we put ourselves in your hands, the extraordinary God, so that you would do incredible things. Even today, Lord, interrupt us. While we're here at this college, interrupt us. For we ask this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen.